So I've put up uh, the title that I provided to you, and as, as I often want to do, I have adjusted my title. Um, the reason I've done this is that I've actually been checking in on the live stream over the past few uh, over the, the past few hours and yesterday. Um, and I think some of the other presenters have quite nicely uh, covered a lot of the themes that I was going to talk about um, in the abstract that I provided, um, uh, specifically on the practices of self-tracking and the mediation of sentience. So I decided that I'm going to let my abstract stand as a contribution to that part of the conversation. Uh, and in my talk here, I'm going to slightly change the angle uh, and take the opportunity to speak not about the subjective uh, side, but rather about a shift that I have been um, noticing in my research, uh, which is ethnographic research with the designers and users of self-tracking technology, um, and a, a shift in the way that mainstream self-tracking technology is designed. So I'm not I'm going to be talking so much about quantified self and extreme self-trackers who re reflect on their processes, but rather how designers are uh, imagining the mainstream users and what they might want or need for self-tracking devices. And I characterize this as a shift from um, compass to thermostat. That's, a, that's an idea I've been playing with, um, which really amounts for me, I mean, the stakes in that shift is a shift in the concept of self-regulation that I think is a, is a really interesting window on, on lots of things. So, um, the, the context for this, this update um, in self-tracking technology by the, the so-called um, mainstream market. Um, and the, the past decade has seen, so, so this context, especially in the US, but I would imagine also over, over there, um, is this a, a huge degree of public and uh, academic conversation around the, the big brother side of things from the, um, the NSA scandal to the Facebook mood experiment uh, and this sort of heated debate over governments and corporations collecting data on citizens and consumers, and then how their use of that data might threaten um, civil liberties, uh, its privacy, et cetera. Um, and I, I, I very much liked uh, Louise's presentation um, yesterday in which um, she kept pointing out that this, um, this attention to privacy sort of endorses a certain uh, liberal subject that um, isn't always at stake in the practices of self-tracking. Um, so even as this, this debate on surveillance monitoring is, is unfolding, you've also seen this uh, embrace by the public of these products and practices of self-tracking. And increasingly, you know, we writ large are, are applying these sensor-laden sensor patches and wristbands and pendants to our own bodies uh, in the name of self-care. And of course, people have long used uh, gadgets, technologies to track themselves, to, to record, to reflect on, to regulate uh, bodily processes, uh, use of time, um, moods, uh, even moral states. And we could, we could broaden our, our definition of technology and include in this uh, mirrors and diaries and weighing scales and thermometers and, of course, wristwatches, the, the lowly mood ring. Uh, but in the past five years, there has been this dramatic efflorescence of self-tracking, which, uh, which is due to uh, the spread of mobile technology, uh, the increasing accuracy and portability um, and affordability of, of electronic sensors, and then also the increasing sophistication of analytic software to make sense of the data. So you have all of this going on, uh, and consumers have been offered this uh, ever-expanding array of gadgets that are they're equipped to gather real-time information from their bodies and lives and convert that information to electrical signals and uh, run it through algorithms that have been programmed for better or for worse uh, to, to reveal insights and also to inform interventions uh, into future behavior. And I think right there you can see the compass thermostat. To reveal insights would be more the compass model and to inform interventions would be more the, the thermostat. And I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, but just to, to, to back up for a moment, um, 
the quantified self movement um, is where my own research for this project started. And it's actually where the research of many of these designers started um, as well. And I'm not gonna go into the, the details of what the quantified self uh, collective is because I think that's been that's been covered in in other uh, presentations. But significant for my uh, my comments here is the the tagline self knowledge um, through numbers. This is uh, for, for these participants. This is an ethical project in the sense that numerical metrics and statistical correlation are being uh, embraced as a route to the good life. Um, and you've got these, um, these, these highly reflexive uh, gatherings to, um, to sort of analyze the, might the ways of collecting self-data um, and getting at these otherwise indiscernible patterns of behavior um, in, the, in the name of sort of becoming a better human being, um, leading a, a better life. Um, and this, uh, this ethos is very DIY. This is just one sort of thing that can come out of it. So this is a self-tracker who, uh, from the New York Quantified Self Group, who is actually, um, you know, making her own visualizations, right? Um, and so uh, the reason the, self, the quantified uh, self movement is important to des the design side of things in the mainstream market is that uh, after I started my research a couple of years ago, I kept noticing this sort of new kind of um, participant, what, not really quite a participant, sitting in the back of the room, um, not there to show and tell and reflect on their own data, but rather there to gather insights from quantified self that could inform um, startups. Uh, these have, have these these characters have been called quantrepreneurs, and I think that that sums it up. Uh, quite nicely. And so the idea is what can we take from quantified self and transfer over uh, to, to the mass market? Um, and with that increasing um, attention on the part of startups and entrepreneurs and app makers, you see, and, and you know, these, these are actually a few years old, I could have totally changed this up based on the current um, app stores, but here you see just a collection of apps for tracking fitness and weight. Uh, here is for tracking relationship and use of time. Um, here's some that address mood. Here you see um, how the aisles of uh, stores like Best Buy have been taken over. This this is not um, these aren't slides I've created. These were created by QS showing. Look, you can you can now go to Best Buy and find all all manner of you know, blood pressure docks and wireless scales, et cetera, um, Fitbits, activity monitors, and of course you find it online. Um, this is the, 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 the category of activity tracker alone um, has 143 um, entries here. Here's Walmart, uh, and here is Amazon, uh, which in the end of 2014 opened this wearable technology storefront um, just for this kind of stuff and very helpfully included. I'm not sure you, you can read it on your screen, but at the bottom I've pasted this kind of um, pedagogically phrased um, sort of a set of prompts to consumers. You know, how might you use this technology? How might you incorporate it into your life? You know, do you need help remembering to exercise? Well, you might try you know, this or that. Do, are you more interested in tracking people or pets? Try this out. So sort of, uh, you know, accustoming the, uh, the market to uh, this, this new range of technology. Um, and we've seen, uh, you know, in, in, in the, the, the upper corner there, you see the Apple Watch, um, the, the, the purple, the quote on the purple there, this is from Samsung's device, very much echoing the language of quantified self. Uh, this device can know me better than I know myself and help me be a better human. Um, so that that was constructed at a time when quantified self was sti still being upheld as the model to emulate and transfer to uh, the broader market. Uh, I'm not going to um, go into detail into these slides, but I do often get the the, the question from people. Uh, you know, are if 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 self trackers uh, who are buying these are not using them as intended or are putting them away in their drawers after two months, um, 
why does this matter? Why is it significant? I think that the, these numbers can be taken as some sort of proxy for the uh, the investment, you know, what, whatever the actual practices are around these gadgets and technologies, uh, we're seeing a, a huge market increase in investment, both on the part of uh, the tech industry and venture capital, and also consumers who um, who are buying these devices. And I think that um, how you can interpret graphs like these as indicating um, a great deal of of hope for these um, devices and also indicating that anxieties are behind that hope, especially on the part of consumers. Um, and I'll get into that in a moment. Um, so I conducted a lot of the, the, the research for the design side that I'm gonna talk about today, uh, the consumer electronics show, which you see here. Um, and in, in the halls and aisles of this, uh, this show that's held annually, um, you find an increasing number um, of uh, personal tracking devices to help people manage the some kind, sometimes quite almost ridiculously mundane aspects of human existence. So things like sitting and moving and sleeping and eating and drinking. So these basic functions of being in the world, um, even breathing, as, a, as I'll um, get to in a moment. Um, and uh, let me just, uh, okay. I'm going to go next to one of the booths, and uh, hopefully um, the sound won't override what I would like to say about this ad. So Fitbit is is considered the real leader in this in this market so far. Um, they make uh, wristbands showing th that can sort of add up to a healthier hue. Uh, I'll just let it play. Should we sound like yeah. yeah. There's 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 no sound. Um, we'll oh, that. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want there to be sound, so I should have just been talking over it. So let me pause and then I'll I'll continue playing it. Um I've got loud sound, so um <laughs> so in in this ad by um you know we, we saw there was this woman playing in the backyard with her children, seemingly carefree, uh, but she she knew and was assured that uh, you know her data was being tracked in her home office, that all this kind of busy work of attending to her own self data was taking place. She could trust the device to capture it. Um, here with this guy, you see, um, made made visible the kind of digital exhaust that we give off in our days. You've got these uh, sort of data ripples coming out from his feet as he is running. Um, and I liked the. Um, the, 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 the way in which we, we see the guy you know, confronting this decision, does he take the metro, does he walk, this kind of, um, he, he's the hero of our story and he decides he's, he's not gonna take the metro, um, he, he is going to walk. Um, and uh, you've got uh, at the end of this ad, um, a, the figure of a sleeping woman um, and it, it tells us you, know, you can optimize even inactivity. Uh, so on that note, um, I wanted to move into a quick review through some of these um, some of these items and the ways in which they're regulating again these very mundane, um, vital aspects of being human, um, not all having to do with movement. In this case, um, having to do with stillness. So some of you may use maybe wearers of the Jawbone wristband and use their idle alert which will buzz you on your phone or on your wrist if you've been sitting uh, for a certain amount of time. This other gadget here in the blue uh, is really dedicated only to, it sits in your back pocket and it simply records the amount of time sat. Uh, and here's one, the, the Lumo Lift, which records uh, posture. So you can wear it on the outside and you can even accessorize it with jewelry or you put it um, on your lapel or your bra strap, and it will 
um, actually buzz you when it senses that you are slouching and uh, gentle vibrations when you want to be reminded through the app control when you're buzzed, how you're buzzed, and even how intensely um, it buzzes. So it's, you know, it's tracking your activity, but it's also tracking the, the angles of your, of your shoulders. And the ad for this is, um, the, one of the ads for this is directed at women in particular. And you see a woman in a boardroom surrounded by mostly male colleagues, and she's sort of hunched over and uh, being ignored. And then, um, you know, you don't hear the buzz, but you know that she is feeling the buzz because she sort of lifts her shoulders back and this little smile plays on her face and um, suddenly people are looking at her, right? And, and, and acknowledging her. And so it says, um, you know, small changes can be empowering is the tagline for that ad. Um, so we've got uh, so far, um, we've looked at uh, sitting and sipping and stepping and standing. So here is um, another device, the happy fork, which um, regulates the activity and modulates the activity of eating. So this is a, a smart utensil that, um, that intervenes in feeding by recording um, the length of each meal, uh, the number and the number of fork servings per meal. And then uh, the time between each of those servings is really the critical unit of focus and regu regulation um, of this device. So uh, if, if that time is shorter than 10 seconds, so you see this woman smiling, and it says 10 seconds. So she's done a good job of sort of wait, you know, waiting long enough. But if it's shorter than 10 seconds, then the fork will oscillate, so you know to slow down. Um, and here is the uh, something from the product literature. Here's a quote. You are advised to take 10 to 20 chews. If you trigger the happy fork's alarm by eating too fast, don't panic. Set the fork down at the side of the plate. Wait till the light turns green again, signaling that it's safe to take another bite. So, you know, people have mocked this, uh, this like Stephen Colbert um, did a little spot where he, he portrayed this as a deeply uh, un-American gadget because it promotes full consumption. Um, but, you know, but the, but the product literature from which I just read is actually not... Um, not written in jest. And what it manages to do is use the words, you know, don't panic and alarm and, you know, signaling that it is safe again. So it's taking this, this, this incredibly mundane, so it's not even just the mundanity of eating lunch, it is break, focusing in on that little unit of how long is the time between fork servings. That's the unit of focus and regulation, but also danger and um, and potential safety if you arm yourself against it with technology. Um, and this, of course, and I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but the, the, the context and backdrop for a lot of this is um, the increasing burden of so-called lifestyle diseases uh, that, that's affecting um, our health and also, our, uh, you know, the, the, this we always hear in the States that $2.7 trillion um, uh, dollars in healthcare is spent on um, things that have to do with these tiny incremental little behaviors. So smoking, um, overeating, um, sitting, hunching, all of these uh, modern lifestyle diseases are, quote, diseases where you have a choice. And so those choices, those tiny little choices need to be regulated. And the technology here is stepping in to do that. And in a really interesting way in the States, a lot of this um, has been developed in conversation with the Affordable Care Act as a, as a way to sort of, um, you know, incentivize consumers to to help regulate their, um, to take control of their health. So here's just some of the data on the Happy Fork that you can go back and look at um, over time. And here, uh, for anyone interested, is what it looks like um, when you eat too fast. So, you know, next fork serving in six seconds. Oops too fast. So here's um, hydration, you know, drinking water. This is another site um, of, um, of focus for, for these, uh, these, this array of gadgets. Here you see one, you know, it's, 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 these are all new and they haven't really decided on, um, there's been no closure or stabilization on what these will look like. So they all take a slightly different approach. 
here what's being tried out is um, a scale that you can, a wireless scale you can attach to the bottom of any water bottle and it will um, keep track using flash, in flash um, built in memory and a weight measuring sensor and accelerometer. It's using that to track how much liquid's consumed and then it's figuring the person as a, um, an icon, almost like a, a what that you are a bottle of water and how filled up are you? Um, here you've got a different one, works a little bit differently. Um, this is called a passive uh, hydration tracking, and you see that it works through gre little green lights, and it will, will flash at you. It also will adjust how much you need to drink by checking into the environment. So what is the humidity? What is the temperature outside, et cetera? Um, and the final one I'll put up here also uses this idea of a body that needs to be you know, filled up um, with water, um, this one, the whole bottle changes from, um, from red to yellow to green. Um, and I just learned yesterday from a colleague that there is um, the, a, a cup that looks like a sort of a kid's sippy cup for adults. And um, it's being marketed as a cup that it can also sort of somehow detect. It has some laser that can detect the calories and what you're actually drinking. And the idea is that you would take this cup with you and put everything that you drink in it, including wine. So you would go to a party with this <laughs> sippy cup and you know, pour your wine into it and your coffee. Um, so that, you know, hints to the, the infantilization um, behind this, you know, that we have to sort of learn how to... Um, to drink because um, we've we've somehow forgotten or, or or life doesn't allow us to check in with our intuitions around that. So, um, you know, moving on to what I've given you a flavor of this this mainstream tracking technology um, that's being put out there. So, what do, what do we make of this as a mode of self regulation? And I think it's clear that the uh, the selves of self tracking. Um, are understood by those who are investing in wearable technology to be choosing agents. They're, they're construed as consumers whose well-being depends on um, and derives from the market choices they make. And not, not you know, market choices as tiny in some cases as fork servings. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, we're familiar with uh, much of the literature out there um, since the 80s and 90s and on, on choice making as a particularly valued and particularly fraught uh, domain of life in advanced liberal societies. And that's very much at stake here. Uh, individuals are urged to shape their lives through uh, choice in this sort of ever vigilant entrepreneurial way, uh, but more often than not, of course, um, lack the 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 knowledge, the foresight, and the resources to navigate uh, the abundance of potential choices, um, leaving them in a predicament, much like in this image where you're you're attempting to um, go through the the uh, to to navigate really the Scylla and Charybdis, this toxic uh, kind of mall of life, um, and how do you regulate your um, your little decisions? So the wearable tech industry. I'm, I'm rehearsing that argument because they very much buy into that. They and they bank on this this insecurity of the consumer um, and this this double pressure to uh, on consumers to regulate and manage themselves, um, but without having the, the tools to do so. And so, wearable technology steps in and says, "Well, here are the tools that you can use." Um, so, so the customers that are being imagined here are um, they're not actually savvy, vigilant. <sighs> maximizing entrepreneurs they're they're anxious they're unsure unsure whether to trust their own senses desires um, and intuitions as they're doing these really basic things in life and making these choices about um, when and what to eat how and much to move or rest and they're kind of flying blind through their daily um, daily routines so the technology is offered to sort of fill in the blind spots and take the guesswork out of everyday living um, and to, to supplement this, the, the short-sighted, embedded in time and space perspective of, um, of the sort of phenomenological experience of the consumer with this more continuous statistical uh, informatic mode of knowing or mode of truth that is able to compute how small choices become um, consequential through repetition 
in a way that humans just can't do. So it's sort of folding in this, this other epistemological um, layer um, and offering guidance as well. Uh, how to offer that guidance increasingly has become a real question in the industry. And um, you know, the, the, the second or third year of my past three years of researching this and going to the Consumer Electronics Show and sitting in on all of these panels, um, I've, I've identified a, a certain debate that, you, that has crystallized around um, this question of how do you offer guidance? What should the guidance look like? This is a slide, this is not my slide, this is a slide from one of these presentations that I've um, sat in on, the Digital Health Summit, which happens at the um, Consumer Electronics Show. And uh, here's a quote from um, James Park at Fitbit, uh, articulating the, the predicament of the industry. Uh, we are still in the infancy of motivational elements. And so the conversation is around, you just provide information do you recommend courses of action? Just recommend, but actually ping users with alerts, keep them on track with goals that they that the gadget has set for them. Um, do you offer messages of encouragement or praise, or maybe shame um, in the manage of a, in, in the manner of a coach? Do you broadcast a user's status? the social network, will that be motivating? There's a whole conversation and it's very, very frustrating for me sometimes because I can see that people are just mixing together uh, all of these perhaps contradictory um, motivational approaches. So it, it'll be like three, you know, three shakes of uh, behaviorist Skinner box and like a couple shakes of positive psychology and sort of stir it all up and throw it at people. And of course there's um, gamification approaches. And then you've seen um, in, the, in the technologies I just um, showed you, uh, the, the, these gadgets that will actually vibrate or use haptics in some way or zap you to remind you of goals. Um, but in the, in, so, so in this general sort of open territory, this open road of uh, how do you motivate average consumers who are not um, who are not motivated merely by engaging with their data as people in quantified self are, um, you, you see this sort of compass versus thermostat um, debate emerging. So on the one hand, uh, so here's, an, here's a Fitbit ad, uh, and this, this I think really fits into the, the compass mode, uh, the compass motivational approach. So the idea here is that, um, and it looks like she is consulting a compass. She may be making a decision about um, should she um, walk to the mall or drive her car. You know, she's checking in with her data, with her compass. Um, this is this is the the kind of data that she may be looking at. And in fact, a lot of this is the dashboard of a Fitbit, and a lot of these actually do look um, like and are modeled after. Uh, compasses. So these are digital compasses for modern living that will help you navigate this sometimes toxic and uncertain landscape of lifestyle management and will inform you of how these small little decisions you're making might add up to big results. Um, so the idea here, and I'm, I'm quoting from uh, someone at, um, at Verizon, I'm sorry, the text sort of is over, over, overlapped a little bit, the idea is um, that you, you build this picture or profile um, of what you're doing, this kind of data double, some have called it, and then you can see, you can understand. So, so there's, your, your cognition is important. Your self-reflection is important. This is self-knowledge. You see what your health is. You get in touch with how the minutia of these little incremental steps and stairs add up. Um, at the bottom, you, you, you have to see now how your choices are impacting you, see how the gauges are moving as you make choices. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you see um, a rising voice um, in the tech industry that, that very much would take issue with this, that you have to see, you have to understand um, this, this kind of uh, quantified self idea of self-knowledge. And the idea is no, consumers not only don't have to see and understand, but they don't want to. And it's going to fail if we're asking them to constantly be in touch with their data. Um, and in fact, what we should be working to do is move from information and reflexivity and self-knowledge 
more in the direction of, of nudges. So we can nudge micro rhythms and choices. We don't have to just give people their information and ask them to nudge themselves. And so um, I'm quoting here um, in the manner of a thermostat. Just a, a few minutes left. Okay. Thanks. Um, so in the manner of a, of a thermostat is the, the, the direction here. And um, this is a quote from someone who's both in the tech industry and herself a tracker. Um, devices that monitor you and give you actionable updates before you even need to ask. I don't, she went on to say, I don't want to track. I want to have it done for me, insert a chip in my mouth, record the calories, et cetera. So um, the idea is that these consumers are like this, this, this woman here, um, that they're not aspiring to autonomy and they're not aspiring to self-knowledge. What they want to do is to outsource this anxiety provoking tedious labor of self-management to um, to devices. So this really amounts, I think, to a move away from the intensive self-attention we see in quantified self, um, more toward um, the, this sort of homeostatic little self-regulators um, that we put on our wrists. And I wanted to finish by um, showing you maybe a um, too extreme example of this. It, it, it almost captures too nicely this trend um, that I'm identifying here. This is called the mother or sometimes the sense mother. So wh whatever you need, whenever you want, um, the sense mother so using these little cookies down at the bottom, you put them on your um, water faucet or your bottle or um, in your under your pillow while you're sleeping. And each of them will detect and regulate some aspect of your life. For example, your water bottle. I affix a sensor to the bottle. It encourages me to drink when I forget. So this is um, a kind of mothering um, approach. And just um, by, by way of wrapping up, I will rehearse this compass thermostat um, by looking at um, three competing technologies. I'm going to do it really quickly uh, that, that run the spectrum from compass to thermostat and that will tie in with some of the other presentations on this panel because what they are attempting to regulate is mood, affect, mindfulness. So the first one here is Muse. And the approach here is really that of a compass. So this is a, um, a seven sensor EEG headset and you hear your brain um, as weather. So you, you're sort of hearing it as wind or calmness with birds chirping. And you, this is, this is um, neurofeedback technically. Um, and you get a sense of how your body feels when um, you are relaxed, when your mind is emptied, et cetera. And the idea is you train with this a little bit and then you go about your day and you build up your own intuitive sense. It's sort of an aid and it's a compass. Um, here is the Spire, and I see the Spire as a kind of hybrid compass thermostat because it's, um, it is tracking you, collecting information. It encourages you to look at your information and reflect on it. What do your breathing patterns look like during information work? What it's doing is it's focusing on your breath, um, but it will also reach out and zap you um, it will vibrate when it senses that your breathing is shallow or erratic, or if you have breath in a while, it will sort of nudge you to do that. So you've got this kind of um, hybrid approach. And then the, the, the final one I'll end with um, is called uh, Think. And there's no tracking whatsoever happening here and no date, no self data really being offered, but it is appearing on the shelves next to the self tracking technology and it is articulating and pitching itself in relation to that. So it, the CEO will say, you know, the problem with Fitbit and the problem with Muse is that it's giving you data and asking you to change yourself. And we don't need that. We don't want that. Um, why should we have to do that when we have technology that can change us? So they've had these random control trials. It's FDA approved. And 90% of people, if they choose the, the, the calm vibe, will, will feel incredibly relaxed, like half a Valium. And if you choose the energy vibe, uh, it's like two cups of coffee. Um, and and, and the, the pitch is also... You know, we're already drinking coffee and taking Ambien, putting these things in our body. Why not just put this on our head, sit there for three or four minutes? It has this effect on us, and we don't need to do any of this work um, on uh, regulating ourselves. So I'll just um, 
I'll just leave it there and I'm going to switch back to the other view of the room.